Hi everybody, we're going to continue looking at our applications of the Reynolds Transport Theorem. In this lecture we're going to be talking about conserving momentum, which is a very important quantity in fluid mechanics. So let's start again with our review. What is the Reynolds Transport Theorem? It says that the rate of this property within our system, which is our moving packet of mass with respect to time, equals the rate of change with respect to time of that property inside our control volume, remember that's the stationary thing, and then plus the rate at which that property enters and leaves our control volume through the control surface. So here's the words that I've used to describe that again. We have the change within our system, the change within our control volume, and the stuff that crossed the boundary. And this is the same description I used before, that we're talking about transport of B, and relating the Lagrangian perspective, which is the system, and the Eulerian perspective, which is the control volume. Okay, so now, today we're talking about conservation of momentum. Let's let our B represent the momentum of the fluid. So momentum, as you should remember from physics, that's equal to the mass times the velocity. And in our little b, that's equal to the capital B over M, so capital B over M just gives us the velocity. And notice that these are vectors. Velocity is a vector. So if I write that out into my Reynolds transport theorem equation, this is what I get. The rate of change of momentum within the system with respect to time equals the rate of change of momentum within the control volume with respect to time plus V times rho V dot N dA. So this is the momentum that crosses the boundary, and remember this V dot N, that's how much mass, how much uh, of our fluid crossed the boundary is what this particular V dot N is related to. Now remember we said that our laws of physics really apply to the system, so our Lagrangian perspective. This term is what we have with Newton's second law. So this is Newton's second law as you saw it in your physics class. We know the change of momentum with respect to time equals the sum of forces on the system. So the sum of forces acting on it equals the rate of change. Now remember we're dealing with a differential case here and in an instant we're allowing the system and the control volume to coincide. So the sum of forces on the system and the sum of forces on the control volume in that instant are the same. So we can look at this as a control volume perspective. And that'll give us an equation like this. We have the sum of forces acting on the control volume equal to the rate of change of momentum within the control volume plus the momentum that crosses the boundary. One key point about this is that we have three equations here because V is a vector. Just like you did in physics class, we can consider the multiple directions to be independent. So I could look at the X momentum, which is going to look like this, and is not going to be a vector equation. So I have the sum of forces acting in the X direction. That's equal to the rate of change of rho times the velocity in the X direction times the volume in the control volume then plus the velocity in the x direction as it crosses the control surface times rho and look this is an important point this term stays as vectors why because we have to remember that v dot n deals with how does the mass cross the boundary and so even though we're replacing our momentum with vx this term only has to do with things that cross the boundary and v dot n is a scalar, not a vector. So here we say that again. This is our x momentum equation. We could get a very similar equation for y and z, just replacing the subscripts here. But our v dot n does not lose its vector notation because a dot product already produces a scalar. This only deals with the direction of the flow relative to the boundary, and v dot n has nothing to do with the momentum. v dot n has only to do with how the flow 
crosses the boundary. I also mentioned this point already. The forces acting on our control volume and our system are the same in an instant because they coincide at our instant in time. That gives us several types of forces that we can consider. So there are body forces. This is a term for forces that act everywhere equally, distributed over the volume. So some examples are gravity or magnetism if we had a magnetically active fluid. Another type of force is called shear forces. These are friction forces that act on the fluid, so those would occur at a surface, not within the fluid, because remember we're only interested in forces acting on the boundaries. Lastly, we have surface forces. These are also forces that act at a boundary, but these are due to the walls themselves or other fluid. So one way to look at it is these shear forces act at a boundary and are um, parallel to the boundary, and the surface forces act at a boundary and are normal to the boundary. So the biggest example of the surface forces would be pressures that we have to deal with. Just like in our thermo classes and our strength of material classes, I already mentioned we only deal with these things when we're looking at a boundary. So it turns out that there's more than one way to look at a control volume for a given problem and that affects the analysis. So I'm going to give you three examples here and we're going to be looking at, I have this pipe, it's a continuous pipe with flow coming in, I'm just showing that it breaks off here because I can't draw the pipe forever. It comes up, it makes this 180 degree bend and then it comes out through a nozzle. So our flow is moving around the pipe in this direction. Well what are our control volumes that we could consider? First, what if I draw a control volume that surrounds both the fluid and the pipe. Well, remember, I need to look at forces that act on the surface itself. I don't have forces acting here at the edge of the control volume. I do have a force here in the wall of the pipe, and I have forces acting in the form of pressure at the inlets and outlets. So let's see that. So here, I think about the pipe wall. I have a force uh, an axial force acting in the pipe, and I have this uh, radial force acting that I could have an X and Y force there, and I can have these forces that are pressures acting at the inlet and outlet where I'm pushing on my flow surface. Notice I drew both of these pushing in to the right. This is one of those things that's like statics that we just have to be consistent. Whatever direction I draw my arrow, I can uh, account for my force the same way. So here I've got a pressure one, really I need to multiply that by A1 to get the force P2 times A2, which is my outlet area, and then these guys are just straight mechanical forces in the pipe. Another possible control volume is to move that control volume onto the inside and surround just the fluid excluding the pipe. So what's going to happen in this case? Well, now I can look at this. I still have my pressure times my area and my pressure times my area at the outlet. But now the forces acting on the fluid are the forces of the pipe pushing on the fluid. Because the control volume just contains the fluid, the force that's acting across that control volume is the pipe pushing on the fluid. So I could have my uh, pressure forces, sort of a reaction force here that distributed over this entire surface, there's some net X force and there's some net Y force pushing the fluid around, and there could also be shear contained in there. My third choice of control volume is just the walls excluding the fluid. So this is a little tough to see, but I'm only looking at the walls of the pipe and I'm not looking at the fluid. So what do we have in that case? I have the force of the fluid pushing on the pipe. So these are equal and opposite to the reaction forces I just drew on the previous slide. And then I also have the forces in the pipe walls that we saw from that first control volume. Notice that the pressure doesn't show up at all here. I don't have anything dealing with 
pressure pushing fluid in or out. This is basically just our solid mechanics problem or our statics problem, like you would have solved in your EMET classes uh, over the years as you took those. We don't have any mass crossing this boundary. This is just pipe walls. It's stationary, and these are the forces that we can see there. So one of the points I want to make through talking about this is that sometimes if we look at multiple control volumes in one problem, we can sort of uh, figure out some of the forces by looking at a different control volume and inferring back what the forces that we were trying to find were. So for example, if I needed to find the force of the fluid acting on the pipe, maybe I would start with control volume 1, get these forces acting in the pipe walls, and then I could come back and relate those to the force of the fluid pushing on the pipe. So just something to think about. We can sometimes combine control volume. Okay, and real quick, I just want to preview our problem that we're going to work on in class. What I have here is an inclined ramp, and I'm going to have water jetting off of that ramp. So I have a water shooting in in a jet with a known velocity and area. And it's going to hit the ramp and curve up and come off at an angle theta. So we're going to assume it's inviscid. You should recognize that means the viscosity is zero. There's no shear forces or frictional forces. And that we're going to assume that the jet has a constant area. So the area here and the area here of the jet are the same. And what we're looking for is how much force is being placed on this ramp. How much force do I need to apply to keep that ramp stationary? Or how much... Uh, if you want to think about it from the solid mechanics perspective, eventually that would tell you something about the stress in this leg holding the ramp up. And that would tell you how strong your ramp needs to be. Okay, thanks for listening, and we'll see you in class.